have dedicated uh, a week to looking at the Antichrist. You've probably heard that phrase Antichrist before, but just what I, I, I want <clears throat> to remind ourselves of is uh, that we are introduced in scripture, and I'm putting this into the into the chat. Uh, you know, the dragon who we know is Satan, the beast who we are described who is described to us also in Revelation 13, which we recognize in Revelation 13. There are two beasts depicted. One is a picture of the Roman Empire, and the second is sort of the, the false prophets who rise up internally, or the the bankrupt religious system, so to speak, that was in operation in the first century prior to the destruction of the temple. You know, the religious teachers whom Jesus is highly critical of, uh, especially in his final week where he talks about the house of the Lord being left desolate and prepared for its destruction ultimately. So we, we've been introduced to these, these themes. But there's another theme in scripture which often people associate heavily with the book of Revelation, and that is the concept of Antichrist which is what we're looking at today. Uh, we also are introduced to the mark of the beast, which we uh, looked at a couple of weeks ago, and we identified that that sort of mark of the beast is a, is a spiritual marker, which sits as the antithesis to the mark that is placed upon the seal, that is placed upon the righteous, which is the Holy Spirit. And we talked about, you know, how 666 has this correlation to Emperor Nero and his name, based on that uh, uh, numerical game, Gematria, that they used to play. Now, this is all refresher stuff. I'm not elaborating on these things. I'm just putting it out there. But often we hear this term Antichrist put out in discussion about end times theology. And people often wonder, you know, what is the Antichrist or who is the Antichrist? And uh, people often liken the Antichrist or link the Antichrist to some of these things that we've already heard. You know, often people will say that the, the Antichrist is a synonymous name for what the book of Revelation calls the beast. Uh, the mark of the Antichrist is that mark of the beast. Uh, you'll sometimes hear there's a, a reference in Thessalonians, which we will um, come across today, which is the, the man of lawlessness or the man of... Uh, uh, sin, which Paul talks about in Second Thessalonians, we're going to come across that particular passage today. Often, people think that this, these things are just synonymous titles, and uh, they may very well be synonymous titles. But we're going to unpack a lot of those things here today and explore the question of Antichrist. What I'll do there is I'll just uh, suspend any further discussion just to ask if everybody's sort of with me at this point in time or if there's any introductory comments you would like to make on the subject. Okay, so let's get into it. First, I just want to put together some exegetical principles. And obviously by the word exegetical, exegesis, we mean uh, exegesis is a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of Scripture. So if you have a chapter of the book, of any book of the Bible, and you are said to exegete it, you know, you'd be going verse by verse. So in other words, just studying each verse of the Bible line by line, chapter by chapter. That's what I mean by exegesis or exegetical principles. So if you've heard me drop that term before and I haven't clarified it, then uh, you have it there. So, you know, I've been bringing forward some of these principles to you as we've gone along. You know, I, I stress at the start one important exegetical principle is getting our heads around the genre of the book of revelation because if we don't get the genre right then our verse by verse analysis will often miss the mark but i want to bring up just two very important uh, exegetical principles that i want to cover that will just help frame our direction when it comes to uh, our analysis of antichrist and you know antichrist uh, is often a popularized uh, term in modern Christian studies of the end times. And often you'll even hear people outside of Christianity talking about these things. You know, things like uh, the mark of the beast, things like Antichrist tend to be the more common words out of end times theology that people understand without necessarily ha having even spent a lot of time considering what the Bible says about end times and 
even reading the book of Revelation, these are tend to be these tend to be terms that people bring up and popularize. And on the screen there, we've got a, a, a movie, uh, the Left Behind movie. We know that the Left Behind series was a very popular series uh, in the latter in the last few decades coming out of America, and it's titled The Rise Rise of Antichrist, and it has Kevin Sobo in it, who played Hercules uh, in in the nineties in that famous uh, TV show. Now I'm not taking a pot shot at him, I actually liked the series Hercules, and I think he's got a lot of interesting things to say, but uh, often, you know, people bring all of these things about Antichrist and who is the Antichrist and the identity of who this person is without necessarily having studied scripture, but rather instead they study the cultural context that we live in and they try to attach the Antichrist to, you know, modern political figures or one world government leaders or even religious Figures. And, uh, you know, I call this principle the moving the goalpost principle. It's very common amongst people that, that popularize end times theology to try to link aspects of the book of Revelation or aspects of biblical end times theology to modern things which are happening in the world today. And whilst I, I don't think that that's completely inappropriate to do, I think there's reason to recognize that we are living in the end times. I think first and foremost, we must always ground our understanding of anything the Bible says about the end times, actually anything the Bible says about itself, for instance, in what it meant to the original audience. You've heard me say that time and time again. We want to study these texts for what they meant to the earliest readers and hearers. So when we hear terms like Antichrist, when we hear terms like Mark of the Beast, when we hear terms like the dragon or the beast or man of lawlessness, how would the first hearers of this, in a plain reading, how would they have understood that stood these things, right? Because our temptation is is that we we try to interpret all of these things in line of with modern culture, and then what happens is after a period of time we move the goalposts. So you know, people back in decades past would have attached the Antichrist figure to Adolf Hitler or to Joseph Stalin or to, you know, it was even popular during the Reformation days. And in fact, brilliant theologians who have been uh, very influential to modern Protestant theology, the likes of uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin, even thought that the Antichrist was the Pope. Uh, there was a lot of corruption going on in the papacy and in the Roman Catholic Church at that time, that's widely admitted by even Catholic uh, historians that, you know, as the Protestant movement tried to differentiate itself from the Roman Catholic Church, it was very common to call the Pope the Antichrist. And, you know, these things often we've got to be careful because after they, while they might be popular at the time, after a certain period of time, when the return of Jesus hasn't happened yet and these figures pass away, it becomes almost like you just move the goalpost to somebody else. And, you know, that if you're moving the goalpost on your interpretation, it tends to indicate that your what how you're interpreting scripture is not usually correct. You know, I, I could understand why it would have been very popular to consider Adolf Hitler during the Second World War as the beast or as the Antichrist, because, you know, he even in some of his, I mean, apart from the devastation that the policies of Nazi Germany uh, left on, on the world and, you know, the, the massacre of, of six million Jews in the Holocaust and even the, the massacre of, of those who were enemies of the German people, not just the Jews, you can understand why people would ascribe the Antichrist to a character like Adolf Hitler. And, you know, Hitler even has some very odd um, writings in his own personal journey, journeys where he talks about making a covenant with the devil in his own personal journeys, uh, journals, sorry, not his own personal journeys, in his own personal journals. We also know that some of his you know, henchmen, some of his chief advisors and some of his chief politicians around him were even involved in occult and satanic uh, worship in different ways. So I can understand why it's popular to try attaching the... Uh, uh, antichrist figure to different people today or at different points in history but we've got to be careful not to move the goalpost whenever we like as is very popular in some uh theologies around the place so that's the first interpretation interpretive framework and just guideline that i want to 
put for those who have been journeying with me as we've been going through the book of Revelation, nothing of what I've said there will be new to you. The second thing that I want to say is a principle that I call a necessary interpretation versus a possible interpretation. A necessary interpretation versus a possible interpretation. Now, there are things in scripture which are clear cut. You know, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is a necessary interpretation from the data that we have. The idea of God being a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, is a necessary interpretation. You can't get around it. The physical crucifixion of Jesus is a necessary interpretation from the data that Scripture gives us. But then there are occasions where we read verses of Scripture where we can derive different possibilities as to what uh, these verses might mean. I'm not saying that this happens a lot in Scripture, but I'm saying it happens occasionally in Scripture where there are possible readings where we can have different interpretations of the same passage of Scripture, and it's okay. And what is important is when we have difficult passages of Scripture is to say, look, here is one possible reading of it, here is another possible reading of it, and we have to live within the tension of those possibilities. So when we read, say, aspects of um, scripture like what it has to say about the antichrist and even some passages in the book of revelation there are some times where there are possible different possibilities that the scripture could be saying and it's faith there are faithful men and women throughout the centuries who have differed on these things and what i would like to say is it's important to differentiate between where scripture is giving us a necessary interpretation against a possible interpretation and uh Many uh, times when you hear people talk about the Antichrist and they try to map out a sequential sort of reading as to what will be the events leading up to the end times, uh, sometimes what they're reading out of Scripture, they're possible interpretations. Yes, you can read those things and, and sometimes they can fit within the framework of Scripture. Sometimes I would say they're stretching different verses to get them to say what they think they say. But I, I think as followers of Jesus, we live in the tension. And what you'll see as I unpack what the Bible has to say about an the Antichrist or Antichrist, there are possible interpretations. There are possible ways of reading these things. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to read them that way. We just have to live within that particular tension. Does, that, uh, does this make sense to you, what I've said? I've spent a bit of time introducing these two principles because I think they will help you as we go along. But does that make sense to everybody there? Are there any observations you would like to make at this point? Can I just ask a, a question? Do you have an example of a possible interpretation that we would understand? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that there are a couple of uh, examples of this in Scripture. For instance, the uh, days of creation in Genesis. You know, um, one day I would love to actually do some teaching on the book of Genesis. But, you know, faithful Christians throughout the centuries have differed on how you read the days of creation. And what I would say is there are people, faithful followers of Jesus, saved followers of Jesus, who would take those uh, days to be uh, literal six, seven days. And, um, you know, that they tend to butt heads with modern science and the like and i would say that there is there is a that, that is one possible way of reading scripture but i don't think it's a necessary way of reading uh those days in genesis and i think there are others who have put forward uh other interpretations to that which i think are also uh, possible as well now there might be some interpretations which have more weight and might be stronger and might make a better case of the, the data than others and i think that it's the job of followers of jesus to assess and to analyze which possible interpretations make the most sense. And sometimes as you analyze that, you can rule out uh, interpretations which just clearly don't fit. Uh, but we, we talk about these things as possible interpretations. They're not necessary interpretations that you have to, to take. And, you know, you can read that. And I've got my opinions over what the days of creation mean and what they actually symbolize. But I would say that within the body of Christ, there is... Uh, you know, differences of opinions and how you reconcile that with modern uh, advances in modern science is actually quite interesting. Uh, but that would be an example, Jill, you could actually uh, yeah. give there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So let's let me just begin by outlining what is the general the generally held belief amongst lay people, I guess, who have uh, delved into what the Bible says about the Antichrist. And you know, this may be your opinion at at this particular point in time. Uh, so you know, as generally speaking, in discussion on Christian eschatology. Now that word eschatology just means the study of end times. It's a fancy way of saying the study of end times. So generally speaking in Christian discussion or Christian uh, study of the end times, most people have this popularized belief that as the end times unfolds, as we live in the end of days, there will be a uh, a wicked figure who will rise up. Uh, most would say that this figure would be some sort of politician, this some sort of political or government ruler who exercises uh, very strong military and political authority. Or you know, some have said some sort of one world government official or something and you know people have said well maybe this could be like the leader of the united nations or maybe you know nations will come together under some sort of new world order type system uh, some have speculated that this wicked figure will be like a spiritual leader as i said it was very common you know and even in some circles for people to liken this to a religious figure like the pope or something like that they Generally speaking, there's this belief that some sort of powerful authority figure will rise up and who will lead the world astray. I mean, the world is going astray already, but will lead the world into some sort of uh, debauchery and lawlessness. And uh, the world will become even more corrupt and even more polluted. And there will be a severe hostility directed toward the people of God. And there'll be widespread persecution. And it's been popular to sort of label this figure as this enigmatic figure as the Antichrist or this mysterious figure as the Antichrist. And uh, po it's a popularized or general belief that this Antichrist figure will rise up prior to the second coming of Jesus and different possible interpretations for who this Antichrist or who this mysterious figure is have circulated throughout the centuries and it comes back to what i spoke about about moving the goalposts that sometimes people will postulate or propose this particular person as the antichrist and then eventually when they die off it's somebody else but it's this general idea that this wicked figure will rise up prior to the second coming of jesus and then eventually this figure will sort of cause people to worship satan and receive a mark or the mark of the beast before eventually christ returns and casts this antichrist uh, into the lake of fire along with the dragon, along with Satan. And um, people will sort of bring together different passages of scripture to try to bring this together and to try to justify how we come to this generally held belief. I'm, I'm sure that this is some sort of stuff that you've heard of before uh, popularized in Christian thought. Now I, I'm not going to, um, desecrate that popular belief today I, i'm saying that you can read verses of scripture to you can read different verses of scripture and come to this possible conclusion you know this is what i was saying before that the difference between possible and necessary interpretations you can read passages of scripture in the bible selected passages of the new testament and come to this general belief uh, but i would say that it isn't necessary and it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily mean that scripture is saying this. I'm saying that it's a possible interpretation of scripture. Does that sort of shed light to everybody mm -hmm. on what the general uh, belief is? If you're not with me, please say something now so I can take a bit more time mm -hmm. to elaborate this. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be honest. Of course, yeah, yeah. And, and as I said, Aris, I, I'm not going to desecrate this viewpoint. I don't think you'll walk away today thinking that, that is completely the opposite. I don't think what I've said will completely turn people's, I don't think I'm going to say anything today that will completely turn people's minds around on this particular thing. I think that's a, a general belief, which, which has some merit to it. But what I think, what I, think uh, I will do today is sharpen 
uh, your belief on this particular theme and maybe get you to uh, challenge certain assumptions. But I think what I think what you'll walk away with today is thinking that there are some clear things that the Bible does say about the Antichrist, but there are some space where we actually just don't know and we need to live in that tension. Where Christians make mistakes or make, make mistakes or where people make mistakes is when they're not willing to say we actually don't know and they become rigid on an interpretation. Sure. You've got to live in the you've got to be able to live in the tension. If God wanted us to know things for certain, uh, he would just spell it out. Uh, sometimes sure. he allows us to live in that in that tension. Uh, and we've just got to accept that. You know, one of the things that we have to live on the tension in, in te- on tension with is when Jesus will return. There is not a faithful Christian alive who can turn around and say, we know when Jesus will return. We just don't. The, Bible, the only data that the Bible gives us on that topic is, I'm not telling you, it's none of your business to get on them with mm-hmm. the job of preaching the gospel. It's That's not true. for you to know. Yeah. Now, like I said, when it comes to possible interpretations versus necessary interpretations, you know, there are possibilities that people, there are interpretations people will bring to this question, which we can rule out very, very quickly, you know. Often we can rule them out over time. So if people say, well, the Antichrist was this person in history, that person in history, we can, with enough time, we can rule out those possibilities. Uh, and that's and that's good. When you can rule out possibilities, that's fine. So when, when you sharpen your opinion on something, it helps you assess what is a possible, what is a, it helps you assess, determine in scripture, what is a necessary, yes, scripture says this and you have to believe this is a follower of Jesus against what is a possible, what are a couple of different possibilities? How can I read this? and live in that tension and how can i is- exclude those which are definitely not what scripture's saying but yeah no thank you for that observation aris anybody else let's begin with the notion of defining what the term antichrist means the the greek word and i put it there for the decoration you may not you know get what those letters mean but the the term antichrist in the greek the root term is antichristos antichristos uh, it's a conjunction word uh, of two different conjunctions, uh, anti and Christ, anti and Christ. It's two conjunctions which have been, it's a conjunction with two words which has been put together. Now, in our modern English, when you say the word anti, I'm anti-church or I'm anti this or I'm anti that, it usually means that you are against that or you're opposed to that. And certainly the prefix in the Greek anti has that connotation of being against or opposite but it has a deeper meaning as well so if you are um anti-god today you would normally be against god or opposed to the idea of god but the greek prefix anti carries a deeper meaning it also means in place of so when we read this phrase antichrist or antichristos in the Greek, it isn't just saying that whoever this figure or figures plural is or are, it isn't just saying that they're opposite to Christ. It is saying that they are setting themselves up in place of Christ, right? So if I were to say that you are anti-Jason in an English sense, you would take that to mean that that person is anti-me. They don't like my personality. They they want to discredit me or they're against what I say and do, right? Uh, but if I was to say anti-Jason in the Greek, it would refer to a person who is not only against or opposed to me, but it means a person who is setting themselves up in my place. So they would be coming along and trying to teach Parkside Thursdays instead of me or, or you know, taking my job title at church or take usurping the areas of church that I have responsibility for you know so if i was to say that somebody was anti-jill in the english we read that and we say well that person is just against jill but in the greek it would mean that that person is trying to set themselves up in place of jill so that phrase anti-christ is not just a person who's against jesus but it's a person who is trying to set himself up against or opposite in place of jesus does that make sense so this person is trying Mm. to take the throne of christ or trying to you know, bear or present to them the world that they are in place of Jesus. And you can see why this would be an appropriate time to talk about 
this particular theme in our analysis of the book of Revelation, because what do we see happening? Satan is trying to take the place of God. He's trying to set his kingdom up, not just in opposition to God as a rival kingdom, but he wants to actually replace the kingdom of God with the kingdom of darkness. And we see in the book of Revelation how the beast tries to, and the false prophets tries to lead people to worship the image of the beast. And we saw the way that emperors were trying to set themselves up as gods amongst men. And uh, that is kind of, you know, Caligula, for instance, wanted to place his statue in the temple of Jerusalem. So what was he trying to do? He was trying to get the people of God. He was trying to have his image instead of the image of God in the temple. He wanted his image to be there in place of the God of Israel. So this antichrist is not just opposed to Jesus, but he wants to be in play in the place of Jesus. Does that mm. make sense to everybody yeah. what the term at least means? So we see this phrase antichrist on five <clears throat> occasions in the Bible. It appears on five occasions in the, in the Bible. And all of the times it appears are in John's letters, John's epistles. So one, two, and three, uh, John, the letters of his, his epistles, it never appears in the book of Revelation. So you'll notice that we haven't at all in the book of Revelation in the 13 and a bit chapters we've looked at, we've not come across this term and we're not going to come across this term in the rest of our study of the book of revelation it just does not appear uh so and this is why this it's interesting that people will sometimes use terms like oh well the antichrist doesn't appear in the book of revelation but the antichrist as the beast is described in revelation 13 it's very similar to the other descriptions that john <laughs> gives elsewhere so that's why they tend to think that the antichrist is a synonymous name for what the book of revelation calls the beast or what paul calls the man of lawlessness so uh, you'll sometimes hear people use these terms synonymously and you know hey as part of this discussion we've got to identify you know is the antichrist um the same as the beast or are these terms synonymous you know uh, and this is part of the intrigue so uh the other question which we're going to have to look at is is the antichrist a singular individual or is it multiple individuals or is the antichrist rather than being an individual is it a system which is set up opposed to christ or is the antichrist as jill as jill sort of alluded to is the antichrist a bit of everything yeah there might be the antichrist singular but there might also be you know the system which is opposed to god just like there is a singular devil or a singular Satan, but Satan is not just that he is an individual, obviously, in terms of his creation, but the, the devil also commands the demons and the diabolical forces of darkness. So when we talk about the things of hell, we're not just talking about Satan, but we're talking about the all of the hellish forces, so to speak. So is this Antichrist a combination of everything? Is he an individual? Uh, are there multiple Antichrists? Is there a system which has been set up against the people of God? And brothers and sisters, this probably makes sense in terms of the world we see today. There are individuals who are key proponents who mastermind the persecution of God's people, the um, figurehead, so to speak. But then there's also a body of people who uh, often oppose the people of God. So when we look at people that persecute the areas of the church which are persecuted in parts of the world. There are often figureheads who lead those countries, but then there are different groups within those nations who are who outwork these things, so to speak. So, you know, these are the questions that we've got to look at and we'll explore in our rest of our time. Now, are there any questions or comments at this particular point? Okay, so the first thing that we need to recognize is that the term antichrist is not a singular term. So let's explore the first time that this passage is used. This, this the first. Let's explore one of the first times this passage is used. It's not the first time. Like I said, the five times it appears, it's always in John's letters. But let's look at one of these times. Could you turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 17? And I want you to listen as I read this. 
First John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an, an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying mm. the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what ha and this is what he promised us eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But his but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Now notice what was one of the big problems in the early church. In the early church, there were those false teachers and false teachers masquerade as being within the church, but are actually not of the church. And there's many false teachers today, even within the church. So what John is writing to this church, and I don't want to elaborate on what some of these false teachings were, but there was things like Gnosticism and the like, which were running rampant in the church. And basically John writes to the church saying that, you know, there are those who are false teachers. You think that they're from us, but they're not really. They don't carry the authentic gospel message. They're not sealed with the Holy Spirit. And he calls these persons antichrists, plural. Antichrist. Mm. Now, he uses this term, the antichrist, singular, and many antichrists, plural. And he uses them as he intertwines them. So there are many antichrists. And the many antichrist and the antichrist are not distinguished in his writings. You know, does that make sense? So if you read this on the surface, it just sounds like what John is saying is that there are many antichrists, plural. In fact, even though he says the antichrist singular, he goes on and he clarifies it where he says, who is this, the antichrist? Who is this? Verse 22, who is the liar? Who is the antichrist? Whoever denies Christ, such person is the Antichrist. So there is no differentiation on the surface between a singular Antichrist figure and a plural, many Antichrists. So as you read John's use of this phrase, and out of the five times the word Antichrist appears in the New Testament, three of them are in this passage that we've just read. Like I said, it's only used in John's writing. It's a term that he uses. It's a terminology he likes like just like uh, you know if you look that you and i have certain words that everybody associates with us that we use and you know that their favorite expressions we use antichrist is an expression unique to john he says i say this because many deceivers plural many deceivers who do not acknowledge jesus as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world any such person is what? The deceiver and the antichrist. The antichrist. So as you read these verses, we realize that when we look back to that first particular general belief that we had, that one day there will be the antichrist singular, this one government or this one ruler or this one spiritual ruler, this one politician who leads the world astray, we realize that, well... When the Bible uses the phrase antichrist, it doesn't necessarily lead us to believe in one individual in particular, but rather a series of individuals. 
And when we have this belief that that generally held belief where people think that the Antichrist singular will be somebody who will come prior to the return of Jesus. Well, as you read these verses, what we actually see is, well, actually, John seems to be saying that these deceivers are coming and going in the church. They were around in the first century and they were around and they still are around today. You know, there are still deceivers who deny Jesus is coming in the flesh. There are still people that, you know, masquerade as teachers, but they, they don't, they're not really of Christ. So does, uh, you know, at the very least, if we, if, uh, what I want you to take out of this discussion today is that the phrase antichrist at if you can understand that there are many antichrists who have come and gone and there are many false teachers and the like who are who are masquerading and who are trying to set themselves up that at its minimum is probably good enough for most people and most people are happy to say yeah there are antichrists who come and go and there are those you know politicians and leaders who will amass over the centuries who will amass a lot of power and you know in the lead up to jesus i'm sure there will be political leaders and the like who amass uh, powers and lead the world astray and lead them into lawlessness uh, lead them into such immorality that the world has never seen and and most people will be happy to sit in that well and in that viewpoint and that will be sufficient for most people and i want to commend you on that although we'll go a little bit deeper than that here today if you're can walk away from this understanding that then you're in a particularly good position and that is sufficient and i believe that is faithful uh, any questions or comments there yeah sorry that i like to follow on um can i just read you what it's got in my bible i've got it like a study bible mm -hmm. and it's it's really interesting what it said about that and you've just said it mm -hmm. but the way they broke it down they said some people at that time accepted the deity of jesus but not his humanity they taught that the divine Christ came on human Jesus at his baptism and then left him at the cross so that it was only the man Jesus who died. In today's climate of logic and reason, some say the opposite. They accept Jesus' humanity but not his deity. The truth combines both. Jesus is both fully God and fully human at the same time. Mm -hmm. I just, I rather liked that. It just helped me to understand it. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's actually quite a, quite a, um, uh, quite a very interesting um, perspective uh, ob observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the type of um, phrase was 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 uh, deceitism, deceit, you know, dolstism, uh, deceitism, which was that that belief in the first century by some that Jesus hadn't come in the flesh as people had said, as was said. The other big, um, the other big um, teaching was Gnosticism. And this was, and John seems to be in different sections of the New Testament seem to be uh, critiquing these positions uh, in different ways. Gnosticism was the belief that um, the, the, it, it was this sort of odd belief that there was sort of um, this, secret information you know the the, the the secret information that you know gnosticism was that you, know, you could get secret information and it was this belief that the material world was created by uh an imperfect god and it wasn't the true supreme god who created the material world because the material world is bad and the object of being a follower of jesus is that you want to escape the material world so many gnostics think that judas was a good guy because he helps Jesus to escape the material world by, by betraying him such that he gets crucified. So the New Testament writers are critiquing some of these false teachings. And John, by calling these individuals antichrist, he's talking about the fact that they're not really preaching the gospel. They're actually doing the work of Satan and trying to lead people astray. Uh, so that's actually helpful, Jill. Thank you for the observation there. Uh, anyone else? Okay, so let's let's get to the the the, the point. Well, is are there any texts in scripture which which say you know that um, there is an antichrist singular singular? So you know, let, let's turn our attention to First uh, John uh, chapter four uh, verses uh, one to three. 
Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now notice he's talking in this plural language. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Uh, sorry, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now, the spirit of the anti of the spirit of the singular anti christ is john saying that the spirit that there is a singular spirit of the anti christ and this is a singular spirit well like i said this passage if you are the person that believes that there will be a singular antichrist who will lead like a one world government or something uh, or a spiritual leader or something who will lead the world astray and he will come at some point prior to the return of Jesus. If you believe that, then brothers and sisters, you know, this sort of passage could be used in support of a singular person. However, I think you can say that given the way John has used that phrase in a plurality of senses, mm -hmm. even in this own passage, you know, uh, many false prophets, many false prophets. Yeah. It, you can say that it could be a singular individual, but even you have to admit that the plurality around it would at least require us to say that it is by no means definitive. What is definitive is that there are many antichrists is there one singular antichrist? Perhaps, but it's not definitive. So when we look at, uh, you know, uh, the dragon as a particular of the devil, the work of the devil manifests in a lot of ways in this world. Uh, and there are obviously plural demons. But we can say that there is a singular Satan, a singular person who sort of led this world into rebellion. But with the Antichrist, as you can see, John uses the term even here in a plurality of senses. And he takes the plural and he brings it down to the singular. You know what it says? You know, we have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists are coming. Singular, who is the liar? Well, such a person is the Antichrist. But this is a uh, a term which is, which is John you which John is using he's interweaving the plural and the singular together so i think we can walk away with saying that what the bible says ultimately about the antichrist is that there is there are many antichrists who are setting themselves up in place of jesus now does this mean that there is not a singular antichrist who is to come who perhaps as we said before in that general opinion will lead the world astray and, you know, will be lawless and will yield incredible political powers and all of those sorts of things, perhaps. But I don't think it's definitive. I don't think that you can walk away from this text saying that there will be, that it's necessary for you to believe that there will be a singular antichrist one day who will be, you know, like a political figure who will lead the world astray. Rather, what is definitive is that there are, many antichrists could there be a singular person one day who will sort of be the embodiment of evil it's possible you can read this and interpret that it's possible but it's by no means definitive does that make sense to everybody what i'm saying or are there any questions or comments at this particular point you know so if we bring it back to what we were saying before about that general that general held view that people have where there is this wicked figure who is going to rise up, who will sort of 
command the one world government or a spiritual leader and people are very skeptical of of you know anybody that wields too much power or different politicians so i hope this simply by understanding the terminology and how it's used on those five occasions in scripture because we've covered those five occasions there's no other we've read the passages there's nothing else which this term is employed um simply by looking at them in their context you can see that you can hold this interpretation but it's not necessary it's a possible interpretation which brings together some of the data um, but it's not necessarily what scripture is saying and this comes back to what i was saying before what is a necessary interpretation from scripture what is a possible interpretation from scripture now by understanding the the terminology we can actually rule out what are some exaggerated thoughts people have on these things we can rule out some of these exaggerated thoughts that people uh, have about uh, whether or not the antichrist is plural or singular or even both notice john says in this passage that this is the spirit of the antichrist now notice he says which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world so what what john seems to allude is that the spirit of the antichrist the thing that is empowering those who are who are setting themselves up in place of jesus and preaching a false gospel and saying things like jesus didn't come in the flesh he's not from god he's not this, he's not that um that notice what he says is that these are coming so there's going to be a future acceleration of these antichrists so to speak but he also says that they're also now already in the world so notice that important phrase already in the world that the work of this antichrist or this work of these antichrists and the diabolical forces of satan and and the demons and the work of the beast and like it was already in operation in john's day to that first century so for those who you know want to liken the antichrist or associate the antichrist with a particular uh figure singular figure you know like hitler or you know donald trump or obama or even the pope or even somebody of big tech so to speak you know you got to be careful because what john is saying is that the work of the antichrist has been there trying to bring a counter offensive to what jesus did satan couldn't stop the death and resurrection of jesus satan couldn't stop the uh, work of jesus so what did he do instead he's tried to limit by discrediting and setting up an alternative uh christ to that of jesus christ now that uh, painting at the bottom there that picture was actually a famous uh, painting from the uh, 12th century which um you know the antichrist is depicted as a king king-like figure there so you know even even as far back throughout the centuries uh, christians have tried to piece together and find the antichrist in their modern world and to try to associate the antichrist with um different figures who who have been raised up and the like but as we can see what john is saying is that the antichrist and the work of the antichrist and the antichrist's plural has been there and it's already it was in operation in the first century you know just like the mark of the beast as i said is not these are not things that we can we 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 should just think that they are happening in our time these are things that are, have been happening right throughout from the first century and I, and we're probably being intellectually dishonest to try to find them in our culture and our culture alone um, but is that and any questions or comments there that uh, anybody wants to ask at this particular point? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks, Arish. Yeah, and like I said, brothers and sisters, I'm not. I'm not in, in none of this. Am I saying that there won't be a ex, as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus? I'm not saying that there's not going to be an acceleration of evil and wickedness in the world, such that individuals may arise who are unlike anything the world has ever seen in terms of their wickedness and their immorality. But it's just it's just a a recognition that you know that that is a possible way to read scripture. But it but generally speaking, that, that phrase antichrist is a is a plural is a pluralized term to refer to you know many antichrists throughout the centuries there. And I think John, if he was here today, he would probably reclarify that particular point. But yeah, any anyone else? Mm. The main cliff, you know, sometimes what I, what you know is when you're standing on a cliff. 
it's beautiful to admire the view, but you never want to walk off the cliff. So what I'm trying to do at times in Revelation by explaining these themes to you is getting you to see the view in its entirety as much as possible without going us for pushing us off the cliff. And often people admire the view and they're too busy watching the view and they don't, they take one step too far. So for those people who try to, you know, say this particular person is the antichrist or that particular thing is the antichrist, we just got to be careful. We can fall into the trap of going over the cliff. And I've said this before at the times that it's very popular, particularly in the Bible world of America and some of the, the popular literature to um, try to associate the book of revelation and everything in the book of revelation between what is going on in our modern culture and our modern worlds, or, you know, artificial intelligence is the mark of the beast, you know, vaccines is the mark of the beast, all these things. Just be careful not to go over the edge of the cliff is what I'm saying. We can live with the tension and we can discuss these things, but just don't go over the cliff. Uh, everybody's with me so far. If you're, if you're not with me, just yep. uh, jump in and yell at me. So I hope by this point, you've dispelled the narrative that I am the antichrist. So for those of you who are leaving threatening, <laughs> threatening letters on my on my desk at church you know please i hope that this i'm nobody's left a threatening letter at my desk on my desk at church but i'm waiting for the yeah, first that one was to a, come yeah that was a fake signature i did today no there you go yeah yeah <laughs> okay so aris brought up a great point what about uh as, as i mentioned there are um synonymous is are there synonymous terms you know yeah john is the only one that uses the phrase antichrist but is antichrist a synonym for other terms that the the new testament uh uses elsewhere you know is antichrist a synonym for the beast in the book of revelation uh and people will often try linking and they'll often try harmonizing the antichrist with other passages of scripture or they'll read the antichrist uh uh, into other areas of scripture. So it's very common uh, for people to find uh, allusions to the Antichrist in the book of Daniel, in uh, Daniel's apocalyptic literature. Now, I cannot elaborate that point because it's a bit too technical uh, and it's a bit beyond the scope of what we are trying to do today. But I, I do think that those who try to link the Antichrist to um, visions that Daniel has I think they're stretching the meaning of what Daniel is saying. Uh, I think we've got to really contain our analysis of the Antichrist uh, to the New Testament uh, because I think it's importing a foreign theme into the Old Testament. So, But there are faithful Christians who, who read that stuff, who read into the book of Daniel, but I, I just think that it's a bit too far-fetched So, and I think it's easily debunked, that thought. So I won't go into any of the references in the book of Daniel that people try bringing. I'm happy to if people want it behind the scenes, but I, I just think that they're importing a terminology into the book of Daniel that Daniel isn't really addressing. That what, what, what they're doing is they're reading things in the New Testament and reading them back into Daniel and making Daniel say things that he's not actually saying. So, But I, I probably upset a lot of people uh, just by saying that. But but two of the main passages that I want to try connecting the dots for people, uh, one of them is what Jesus says in Matthew 20, 24. Sorry, Matthew 24, 24. Remember in that context, Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple. And it's good for us to go here because we've spoken about how the book of Revelation is talking heavily about the destruction of, well, a fulfillment of a lot of the book of Revelation is found uh, in the destruction of the temple, which happened in AD 74. I defended that proposition or I talked about that proposition earlier in here in our study. So you can go back to that material. I, like I said, I'm not the one that's come up with that interpretation. Many, many faithful Christians have believed that the book of revelation is, is finding its initial fulfillment in the destruction of the temple in AD 70. But Jesus is talking about that event. Remember Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And he gave all of these signs for the, the, the new Testament church to look out for which would be precursors to the destruction of the temple. And one of the things he says is false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, when we, we hear that phrase antichrist, remember the antichrist is the Greek. Christ is the Greek word. The Hebrew word would be messiah. So if we're thinking about the line of antichrist, 
Could false messiah be a synonymous term for antichrist? Mm. And I do think that that's mm. quite reasonable because in the first century, many, many false prophets emerged who were claiming to be the messiah. When we read the second part of the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 13, and we're talking about the second beast who was, who was basically, we spoke a couple of weeks ago about that second beast being the corrupt um, religious system and being the false prophets who arose in that time. And many of them performed miraculous signs to try leading people astray. Now, the end of the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 20, will talk about how um, these false prophets, the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. You know, is that term false messiah a synonym for antichrist? And I, I think that's pretty legitimate because you've got those who are setting themselves up, those who are trying to, those who are trying to put themselves up in place of Christ. Well, what was a false messiah doing? A false messiah was trying to usurp Christ and say that no, Jesus is not the messiah. I am the messiah, and they were leading the people astray. And when we look at, you know, in this book of Revelation in chapter 13, you know, we talk about how, how uh, Revelation 13, 13 says, this second beast, he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven. So, you know, he is deceiving people and he's causing them to worship the beast rather than the true God. So, you know, I think that's, that's a, a genuine connection that people could make. Uh, but the other passage, which is... Um, which is really, really interesting is uh, Second Thessalon is Second Thessalonians chapter two. If you could turn to uh, brothers and sisters, if possible, I'll need just another ten minutes just to uh, bring these things together because it is a quite a um, uh, extensive topic. But could you turn, please, to Second Thessalonians chapter two? And uh, if somebody could read for us, please, um, verses second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to uh, twelve, uh, inclusive of twelve as well. If somebody could read those twelve verses for us. Yeah, no, I can read it, Jason. Thanks, Aris. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him. We ask you, brothers and sisters, do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until a rebellion occurs and a man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God. Or his worships that he himself set, set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one you know hold it, holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance of how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sent them a power for destruction so they will believe the lie. Sorry, powerful delusions so that I will believe the lie, sorry. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Yeah, thank you, Aris. So in, in the context of Second Thessalonians, there are some concerns that is happening in the community in Thessalonica. And the the brothers and sisters in, in Thessalonica are getting a bit worried about how close the return of Jesus is. They've got some questions and some concerns. Some of them are quitting their jobs because I think, oh, if Jesus is going to work, it's going to return any day now. Why do I need to work? Some of them are worried about, well, has Jesus returned and have we missed it? 
you know, what's happened to our those who have died already? Uh, you know, have they gone to be with Jesus? Are we have we missed out on this? And Jesus and, and, and Paul basically reassures them. The day of the Lord has not happened yet. The second coming of Jesus has not happened yet. And he says concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him. So in other words, our being returned to Christ. Uh, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us. So the confusion of the, the church in Thessalonica is becoming even more confused because they're receiving reports from false teachers who are saying all of these things. And he says that, you know, don't let anybody deceive you. The day of Jesus' return is not going to come until first the rebellion occurs. And he introduces us to this uh, mysterious figure, the man of lawlessness. You'll sometimes hear it translated as man of sin or, you know, son of perdition or something like that. It basically uh, is this figure. And he says that this, man of lawlessness is uh, doomed to destruction. He will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God himself. And, and some people have, as Aris pointed out, some people have taken this term man of lawlessness and connected the dots between the man of lawlessness and what is said about Antichrist and said, well, this must be the same event the same person and you can see why you know you can see why people have connected the man of lawlessness with the antichrist and with the beast because the beast is you know worshipped the book of revelation says and this man of lawlessness sets himself up in the temple of god now there have been different interpretations as to how the church has interpreted this man of lawlessness over the the centuries people have in the earliest uh, church, in the earliest days, uh, you know, people tended to see this as some sort of figure in the early, what was happening in the first century. So like an emperor or, you know, like a figure who you, wields a lot of power and causes a lot of destruction. So obviously in the, you know, the first century, you had the likes of Nero um, who basically was a lawless individual in his sense. In fact, ancient writers like um, Tacitus and Swintonius, uh, Apollonius of Tyana and the like, uh, Pliny the Older, have described the activities of Nero just in this complete, uh, just this, complete and utter lawlessness of this man in fact apollonius of, of tyana who wasn't a christian nicknamed nero the beast and talked about how people were really using this word to describe him so you know it doesn't surprise me that the new testament the book of revelation uses that political cartoon of an image of the beast to describe the roman empire at that point because around the time john gets his his uh apocalypse nero is really lawless in how he is behaving i mean his the stuff he got up to the brutality the grotesque nature of who he was i mean he he murdered in violent fashion members of his own family he had them executed he kicked to death his pregnant wife kicked to death his pregnant wife he murdered his own mother he uh, mutilated the and to our, our our female members of of this conversation please forgive me for being um you know descriptive he mutilated the genitalia of a man and then sought to marry him nero would dress up in the carcasses of wild animals and then as some sort of weird game that he would play to in front of an audience he would um this didn't take place in the Colosseum because the Colosseum hadn't been built yet but in you know the other um Circus Maximus I think it was called or um the the other you know basically the in 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 the uh, stadiums where they would uh do their games and stuff like that yeah the Circus Maximus he would dress in like the the clothing of wild animals and the skins of wild animals. And he would be 
in a cage and he would be released from the cage and he would go and he would he would tear and he would bite and do all sorts of weird things to you know the genitalia and the body parts of people who were tied to the stake and stuff like that he was really described mm -hmm. in the test fashion now yeah, there might be hyperbole to some of these things that these ancient writers because ancient roman writers did not like nero but he really was a man of lawlessness right so it, yeah. it, it if it, it wouldn't be a stretch for many in the new testament church to be reading paul talking about the man of lawlessness and connecting some of the dots and you know it's very easy to connect the dots so i i think there's merit to say that this man of lawless was lawlessness was a was you know a figure in the in the first century uh the difficulty that some people will have is that it talks about this uh man of lawlessness sort of uh setting his image setting his image in the in god's temple and proclaiming himself to be god well certainly the the roman uh um certainly the uh some of the roman caesars did that people like caligula and nero and the like others it was con these divine titles were conferred on them after their death like augustus i don't think he walked around claiming to be you know a divine being it was sort of the senate conferred those titles to him you know and, and especially after he died but um you, you know it often people have tried to say well when does this man of lawlessness sort of put his his insignia or when does he sort of set himself up in god's temple and proclaiming to be god it really define it really sort of comes down to what you how you interpret that phrase set himself up in god's temple is it the literal temple which is one way to read it prior to 70 ad or is it the temple of christ which is the body of christ which is we are now the temple of christ remember jesus says see your house is left mm. desolate you know and there, there was a lot of there was a lot of activities happening in the first century which could fit this you know the roman insignia was was uh people tried to play it was placed in the temple for a while which sort of led to uh, the jewish revolt and you know the jesus talks about the abomination which causes um uh, desolation which we've, we've heard about and there's different um interpretations for all of these things uh, an another interpretation for the man of lawlessness it has been uh which was popular in the first few centuries after the first century was this idea that the the man of lawlessness would be some sort of political figure who emerged after the roman empire collapsed uh, pretty much uh in pretty much since the middle ages most people have interpreted the man of lawlessness as some kind of uh, futuristic figure which is why you know we we come to that conclusion that the antichrist will be a future figure who will be a lawless one so i mean like i said all the second thessalonians chapter 2 in the man of lawlessness is not something that that scholars and christians have one universal interpretation there are different interpretations and um it's one of those things that we have to live in the tension. I can't resolve that problem for us here today. I can't tell everybody, yeah, this is the man of lawlessness. It's not something that the church has ever been able to identify clearly. And part of the reason is, is because Paul himself um, talks in this letter. He says in verse five, don't you remember when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. So Paul has obviously divulged more details about who this man of lawlessness is, which we don't have access to in Second Thessalonians. So like I said, we have to admire the cliff and admire the view without going over the cliff. And it's just one of those things where we've got to live in tension about. And Augustine, the great theologian, sort of came out and said, we really don't know who this figure is. So brothers and sisters, I, I just caution us from being too clever and trying to connect the dots maybe the man of lawlessness is a figure who is to come prior to the return of jesus we just don't know exactly who it is but what i want to mm. say is how do we bridge the gap you know we've spoken about and sorry brothers and sisters i know we've gone over time just give me a couple more minutes we've spoken about revelation 13 and the beast being this roman <coughs> empire and the mark of the beast was a sort of a reference to Nero and and six six six. But how do we 
how do we bridge the gap for us today? You know, how do we bridge these themes today? I think it's important for us to recognize that the New Testament presents the, the work of Satan and the work of the beast or the work of the Antichrist as things which continue. They were there in the first century. They were the diabolical forces were there in the first century and they are still in operation today. You know, yes, the, the New Testament used these terms like false prophets and false messiahs and antichrists and the beast, etc., to depict a group of individuals who, as Jill was saying before, like a group of individuals who stood against Christ. They were in opposition to Christ. You know, they're, they're, there is not one singular false messiah or one singular antichrist. There are plural individuals who set themselves up. And yes, the New Testament community saw fulfillment to these things if you asked the as we've been able to identify that they they saw the beast as as what was happening in their time the work of the beast in in the way that rome was coming to destroy the temple and and all those sorts of things they saw fulfillment in the first century but that doesn't mean that they didn't think that these things were going to continue until ultimately christ returns you know, there are many empires who have set themselves up against Christ throughout the centuries and who have persecuted God's people. These diabolical forces which Satan are using continue even to this, this day. There are antichrists even to this day who are trying to lead the world astray. And Satan, the dragon in Revelation 13, sits buried underneath these things. And we as the kingdom of God, which the rest of the book of Revelation will talk about, ultimately, we are the one who are pushing back against the work of the beast and the antichrists in the way that we expand the gospel message. And ultimately, whether there is a singular antichrist who is to come, a singular leader, a man of lawlessness who will escalate people's depravity prior to the return of, of Christ, we can debate that. But what we can say for certain is that the New Testament church, as they were receiving the apocalypse, they saw fulfillment in their early day, in their in their cult context. They were able to draw markers and correlations between what was happening in their world to the signs and symbols and the clever descriptions that the book of Revelation was giving. They saw the beast in their day. They saw the antichrists emerge in their day and the false mm -hmm. and the false prophets. Now, those spirits continue even into this day and yeah maybe there might be a singular figure who will emerge prior to the return of christ we can debate those things but what is conclusive what is un indisputable is that ultimately the lamb wins in the end ultimately the book mm -hmm. of revelation which mm -hmm. we will get to talks about in revelation 20 10 to 11 and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. The beast and the false prophet. Those two instruments which Revelation 13 talk about, the beast which we spoke about in the first part of Revelation 13 and the false prophet in the second part of Revelation 13, those diabolical forces who were the spiritual forces which were within the church trying to lead the people of God astray they had been thrown also in there. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Into hell they're going. And what does it say? Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them.